Welcome everyone to this webinar. This is a best of Galvanize webinar. My name is Katia and I'm a contact impact manager here at Insights Consulting and I will be your host for this webinar. Three weeks ago, the whole Insights team went on a team building in Ibiza and like the tradition, every um, uh, every team building, we start the team building with a, our very own Insights uh, conference, a congress where uh, insights, insiders take the stage and they present a unique blend of case studies, inspiring debates, ID pitches, and also some conceptual thinking. And this is also what we're going to present here during this uh, webinar today. The theme of our conference was galvanize and might sound familiar with the chemical reaction, but if you look at what galvanize means, you can Google it, you get two type of definitions. One is that it means to cause people to become so excited or concerned about an issue or ID that they want to do something about it. And the second one is a more chemical one. It's about covering with a layer of zinc to prevent this from rusting. And just like this chemical chemical process of adding a code to prevent from rusting, the Insights team took the stage to share their work and thinking on how to prevent research from rusting and how to create that unique blend uh, uh, in projects, but also with our clients and in the work that we do every day. This conference was very excited for all of us. In total, 135 insiders submitted, submitted contributions and from those, 78 people took the stage in Ibiza. You can see we had a, a full program, a crowded program, and of that program, we selected six presentations, six 10-minute presentations, which will also be presented here during this webinar that we thought might be interesting and inspiring for you uh, today. We will, um, we will go from uh, Belgium, as um, we're presenting this here uh, from our Belgium office, but we have presenters also from our US office, and we have also some presenters, uh, well, Tom is in fact in Munich, who will presenting live from Munich. So we will be switching around and seeing how uh, we're also using this webinar platform for the very first time, how is this is gonna work. So if there are some technical issues, please let us know. We're very excited to try this out. And um, I would, um, I'm going to uh, introduce our first presenter of today. Uh, every presentation will be about 10 minutes. And after the presentation, there's also some time to ask some questions. So if you would have any questions during the presentation, just simply use the chat box at the left hand side normally and uh, let us know what you think, if you have any feedback and so on. And we will pick up those questions after each, pres each presentation. Our first uh, speaker of today, uh, live from our US office, is Thomas. Uh, Thomas is a business director here at Insights Consulting. He used to work uh, also uh, from our Belgium office, and I think about two years ago, he moved to the Big Apple. And his talk is going to be about entering the experience economy. So Thomas, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Katia. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, as Katia mentioned, in the next 10 minutes, I will talk about how we can wow our audience as researchers uh, and why we should in this talk, memory times empathy equals change. Um, so why would we want to do something different um, to increase the impact of research? Well, our research shows that only about half of the market research studies in the industry um, are actually successful in driving change. So that is thinking, uh, kind of looking back in time, uh, looking at the most impactful work we've done within Insights Consulting and trying to get the learnings out of that work. Um, and this goes far beyond just generating great consumer insights. So in our experience, it's really also about the way in which deliver in which we deliver these insights. Um, so we think that should be in a way that is both memorable and that is generating empathy. So what type of research deliverables do you think succeed in this ambitious goal of making insights more memorable, making them stick, and generating through consumer empathy? Is it this type of deliverable, raw data, like a table report or a transcript? 
I don't think so. Um, is it a fully designed PowerPoint presentation with conclusions and recommendations, which is kind of a standard deliverable? I think this is great, but probably not enough. A workshop to turn insights into ideas, into actions, like we host typically at the end of a project. Um, we might already be getting closer into generating true impact. Well, Pine and Gilmore developed this great framework, which you see on the slides, on the progression of value. Uh, so let's take a look at where these different research deliverables would actually go. Raw data is what we would call a commodity. It's not differentiating, and the value is also uh, pretty limited. When we move up, when we turn these results into a PowerPoint presentation, we would call it a good. And only by adding workshops, consulting, we can actually refer to research as a service, which is more differentiating. It's also perceived to add more value. But the challenge we have here is the question, is this service level enough to truly drive change with research? And to answer this question, we explore the extremes of the service level of this adding a layer of consulting and workshops in a study for Philipsoni Care. So we carefully mapped out and designed all the touch points to engage the clients throughout the project. We presented the team with immersive consumer data, developed custom models, used out-of-category cases to inspire the client, we hosted a workshop, and we even handed out postcards. So at the end of the workshop, every member of the team could write their future self a postcard on actions they were planning to take. And then we collected all these postcards and sent them back three months later as a reminder. So they kind of could check if they really took the action they were planning to take. And when we tested the impact of this study, we noticed that we scored really well on making the insights memorable. The different stakeholders within Sony Care still knew exactly what the relevant insights were for their market or for their category. Where there was room for improvement was actually the empathy level. They struggled to really kind of come up with specific anecdotes, with specific consumers, uh, kind of bringing them into their minds, kind of stepping in their shoes. Um, and we think you need both empathy and memory to drive change. Luckily, Pine and Gilmore's framework features a fourth type of offering, the level of experience. And we define an experience as a series of events that stimulates the senses and that activates an audience to pay full attention. So by definition, it really kind of immerses an audience in the content, in the lives of consumers, and does it evokes memories which are crucial in creating memories. If we can get some type of emotional connection, we're also more likely to create both empathy and memories. The question is, how can we deliver market research on this level, the level of extreme differentiation and of extreme value? Uh, and there's different dimensions if we want to come up with market research as an experience. And the first dimension to take into account is the participation level. Do we want people to interact with the experience, with the flow of events, or do we want them to just observe? Obviously, active participation interaction is easier for smaller audiences. If you want to engage a whole department in an experience, uh, it might be easier to let them be just observers. And then, of course, we think about the objectives we want to achieve. Do we want people to absorb the insights and make them memorable on the top? Or do we want to immerse them in the lives of their consumers and generate empathy? And I've been playing around with experience uh, for a while now. Uh, and looking back in, let's say, typical impactful research projects, um, we mostly have experience on the right side of the spectrum, actively engaging a smaller audience. For Air France KLM, for example, uh, where we shared the results of a concept test as a concept casino, uh, where everyone in the team could place their bets on the concept they thought scored highest on a specific KPI, as you see on that picture. Um, and this was kind of a way to truly make them think before we share the scores, and it really made the results stick. For Heineken, we wanted to increase their empathy with the target group of party people, uh, so we took them on a lounge tour and gave them empathy cards with activities to perform to relive the journey of their target groups. Now, if we look at the left side 
of the spectrum, we also have some exciting examples. Uh, so when Skype wanted to introduce a new metric in their organization called the user pulse, they also felt the need to tap into experience. So they built an installation with every data point represented by a physical ball. Uh, so you see their CEO there before the installation. Uh, and then an Airstream shoots the balls in the air to the correct corresponding height to show if the specific score goes up and down. And you can imagine with an audience of Skype employees in the room, uh, that when the KPIs go up and the ball shoots higher, uh, the crowd really goes wild. And last but not least, we kind of have this interesting space where how do we create empathy um, with a bigger audience? And typically you might think about an in-home ethnography where the lucky few, uh, three people are kind of invited in the homes of a consumer and they can look around and feel and touch. So how can we make this more scalable, this immersion within the lives of consumers? And we think that technology now more than ever might provide a kind of a shortcut to making these types of empathy experiences um, scalable and available to a bigger audience. So if we would think back about the Philip Soniker project, where we felt that there was a room for improvement on the empathy level, um, I would like to give you an example of something we could do there uh, to improve that by staging an experience right here, right now, uh, using technology that most of you currently have in your pockets. So um, if you have a smartphone laying next to you or in your pockets, um, please take it and open your browser uh, and go to thomas360.net. Uh, and it's really important to open this in YouTube um, if prompted, so not just in the browser. Uh, so I'm going to give you a moment. This is like a real thing, so I'm really asking you to open your browser and go to thomas360.net uh, at the moment. Um, and if you do, and maybe you can kind of give a shout out in the chat box if you got it to work and you create a play button, you'll be able to look around in my bathroom uh, just by moving your phone around. So you have the freedom to decide um, where you want to look in this 360 video. So you can literally look over my shoulder when I'm brushing my, tooth, uh, my teeth in my very own toothbrush routine um, by moving around and looking around in my bathroom. Um, this only works at the moment with the latest version of YouTube. So if it's not kind of the most immersive result, um, you might have to update it and try it later in time. So I hope some of you got that to work indeed. Uh, and you can imagine with a simple pair of virtual reality goggles uh, or Google Cardboard, which I think is $15, uh, you can put your phone in and it gets even more immersive. It gets even better. Um, so this is an experience that we would actually map on this uh, bottom left quadrant um, where we are immersing a bigger audience um, in the lives of consumers. Key in this framework, I already mentioned that to drive change, we need both memory and empathy, is not to focus on just one quadrant. It's about coming up with a series of events to tap into different um, quadrants. Uh, and as you'll notice in the final presentation, um, there's actually um, our studio, our Consumer Insight Activation Studio, um, this is kind of a little bit of a preview of what the future um, of this solution might be, where you can engage your big audience, your department with consumer insights and this type of 360 degree footage uh, and other experiences, of course. Um, so to end this presentation, uh, what are some takeaways for you all if you wanted to try uh, and reach the experience level with research? Um, well, first of all, it might take some type of unique data that is not always part of how you currently do research think about this 360 degree footage. Uh, that is something we need to kind of include in the research design up front. Uh, we definitely see that there's an opportunity to tap into technology, not just um, virtual reality or 360 degree videos. Uh, think about the balls popping up in the air for Skype. That's also a smart use of technology. Um, and we can go really wild. So to keep the cost down uh, and reasonable, it's really important uh, to merge this thinking with 
lots of creativity. Um, and this 360 degree video, for example, this experiment actually costs less uh, than $360 um, by purchasing uh, just this camera on Amazon, which is a little bit of a, of a segue uh, to the next presentation where Philip will talk about his, uh, his Amazon addiction. Uh, and last but not least, it's important to add some kind of purpose um, to not make it into a gimmick, um, but to really link it to your objectives. Uh, so I don't think this is something for every project. For a simple logo test, I wouldn't recommend it. But for a strategic project that requires a transformation, uh, I truly believe that experience is the way to go. And yes. I think I'm handing over to Katya. Yes, thank you, Thomas. And thank you for that sneak peek into your morning ritual in the bathroom. Um, I don't know if there are any questions uh, for Thomas at this point um, about how to take experience uh, to the next level when it comes to research results and research impact, maybe. If so, if you would have any questions, uh, Thomas' email is right there on the screen. Uh, just send him an email uh, or give him a call. Uh, next up is uh, Philippe. Uh, Philippe is our uh, managing partner, uh, one of the managing partners here at Insights. And uh, he's also managing director of the US office. And he's going to uh, tell us uh, or what, what we can learn about his, uh, from his addiction to Amazon. Thank you, Katya. Um, indeed, this is a confession uh, of me as being an addict to Amazon, Amazon.com. Uh, and this is actually a, qu a quote that I made um, not even five years ago, uh, where I was still convinced uh, that Internet was actually useless and worthless, and especially um, everything that had to do with e-commerce had no potential uh, for the future, at least uh, for me as a person. Then I... I, uh, I moved to uh, the United States, to New York, and then I said, okay, let's let's use this Amazon uh, because, and after all, I am in America, uh, and I went back and I dig back into my order history, and this is actually the two, uh, my first order that I made, um, let's say two orders in the same week, um, and it was interesting to see that it was actually like a shower gel and then a Samsung uh, stick uh, to put in my into my smart uh, TV. Then I became a Prime member, and that is, I think, when uh, it really triggered me to go from a, what I would call more an ad hoc purchasing behavior to a real uh, addiction. And then Prime membership, for the people who don't know it, is a $99 yearly fee that you pay to get a really kind of great service, um, two-day free shipping, free returns uh, at all time, uh, and just uh, free access to music, to uh, movies, uh, etc. So it's, it's a, a whole world that opens when you uh, become a member of Amazon uh, Prime. And this is the result. Uh, this is, let's say, the flow of my orders, the, the evolution of the number of orders that I make um, uh, every year. Uh, and you see that is really increasing to an almost worrying level uh, this year because I almost uh, placed as many orders um, as last year, and we still have a couple of months to go. So I, I wonder where I will end up uh, this year. Um, and just in terms of how important it is for me and in terms of my, my total spending, I spend 6% uh, of my of my total disposable income on Amazon, and which is I shop from groceries to clothing to everything, appliances uh, on uh, Amazon. And by the way, 6% is also the amount of body fat of the guy uh, in the middle. Uh, just so you know, the one on the left is 4%, the one on the right is 10%. Uh, body fat. So maybe I will evolve to the 10%, um, uh, let's say, of total disposable income spending uh, in a couple of years. This is actually a client of ours who used to work for um, Amazon. Uh, he was the executive creative director for product experience. Um, and so it's not only in terms of the money that I spend, it's also in, in say, what I spread in terms of uh, ambassadorship that he says um, it, it's crazy. It's amazing how you love that brand. is something that uh, they can only um, uh, be proud of uh, back in Seattle in the headquarters of, uh, of Amazon. So it's not only behavior. It's also my attitude and how I uh, how I spread the word. So knowing this uh, and and how I got addicted to this brand, um, I just wanted to um, did a little bit of introspection, a little bit of uh, self analysis without the help of a therapist. I just did it myself to also learn what is that what what are the triggers of that addiction, what is driving that addiction, and my continuous involvement and engagement with Amazon uh, as a brand. The first one is all about uh, ecosystem, and and uh, I, I think. 
it is very important um, uh, for me that it is almost like a safe zone where I can uh, where I can grow, where I can interact with a brand across uh, multiple touch points. So if you look at this, this is the hardware that I own uh, of Amazon, going from the Amazon Echo to the Fire uh, Stick, the Fire TV, and the Amazon Dash buttons, where with one push of the button, you automatically order, uh, let's say, your favorite brand or your favorite product uh, that you ran out of um, uh, in, in the house. Um, and this is the, let's say, the amount or, or the plethora almost of brands, touch points, call it memberships that I have or services that I use of Amazon. It is amazing. And it's also ever expanding. Like the number of, I, I'm sure, although I'm such a fan, I'm sure that there is things out there of Amazon that I haven't tried yet. Uh, so that, that's crazy. It's a, it's a big world full of surprises and, um, and let's say, exciting experiences. And that is also interesting and it's very, uh, I would say, ingrained in who Amazon is in, in their core DNA. This what we do, uh, are we, we measure our success uh, against what is possible and not against what is probable. And that is, I think, really the attitude um, uh, to, to go for in the future as a brand. And don't, don't do what is probable. Don't do what consumers expect you to do. Um, uh, try to think of what you could do in the future and try to aim high. Um, and that is why... Amazon just increases revenues over and over and over again every year, while actually their bottom line stays pretty stable. That's because they invest in the future. They invest all the money that they make, and it's a lot. And they are now valued at $300 billion. They just invest that in the, in the future and in better products, more services, and, and even, let's say, in the possibility to hire a goat to graze your lawn um, when you're too lazy to mow to mow yourself. So it's it's quite a it's kind of amazing how within that ecosystem and, and they did just develop more and more touch points with still a kind of um, a very predictable uh, I would say um, service level. So that is what is predictable. Uh, but then whatever they offer within that uh, ecosystem is really surprising and exciting and pushing the boundaries of what is possible. So that is the, that is the first one is the ecosystem. The second one is um, I think as you know and and showing all of those things that they do, they innovate a lot. And, and, and it's not also only about innovation because that's a very internal perspective. I think it is also about building anticipation for your innovations. And that is something that I think brands can learn from uh, not only Insights Consulting, but also brands out there is what all what of the things that you are innovating for what are the uh, what are the things that you want to create um, anticipation around and anticipation is for me a mix between uh, driving awareness uh, you have to know about it and also a positive feeling a positive excitement of what's to come and then one of the things that really makes my heart tick is uh, one of the plans of Amazon is to use drones uh, prime uh, to within prime air a new service to offer 30 minute um, uh, deliveries and this is what it actually looks like it is actually tied into their whole logistics system and their warehouses that it comes off uh, the conveyor belt and it, it just picked up by a drone and, and it drops uh, it off in your backyard um, it also doesn't have to be very futuristic or future forward, as in the example of the drone. Sometimes it can also be just a very basic, like going back to a brick and mortar uh, bookstore, which is also a great success uh, for Amazon. I also picked up that Amazon is going to go into the uh, produce, like grocery uh, shops, stores. Uh, think really fruit and vegetables and meats and, um, and poultry, selling it in, in a store uh, in the city uh, of New York. So again, uh, it's not always going into the future and, and, and future technology, but also just going back to basics. And those are the things that make me feel like this, which is all about the reflection of uh, anticipation and excitement. The third one is about awards, and not so much with their technology, because their technology is almost self-evident. They just consider that as something that has to work. Uh, it is more with the content that they produce within uh, within that ecosystem. And a great example is uh, all the prime um, uh, movie uh, content that they they have uh, Amazon Studios, and they uh, are creating amazing shows, um, amazing movies uh, with with great actors. They are able to uh, attract great talent in terms of directors and actors and they just, uh, again, uh, two years in a row, are winning quite a lot of uh, Emmys um, at the same level of, let's say, an HBO or an AMC um, uh, company. Uh, and then the third one, uh, the fourth one is, uh, and this is a video that apparently is not but this uh, it's pretty predictable what uh, is going to happen to this woman she's actually just gonna uh, tumble down and fall uh, it's also allowing yourself to fail 
and, and this is a great quote of, of Jeff Bezos, the CEO again, who says, I have made billions of dollars of failures at Amazon.com. And, and, and of course, he says it's never fun uh, to fail, but also it's, so there is also a point where you say, you know what, it doesn't matter. I learned from it, and it's also about just taking what you learned and into the future and uh, making it better. Uh, some great examples is that once there was a plan of making Amazon also a travel agency, Amazon Destinations. Um, the Amazon Fire Phone, again, something that is still on the market, but is uh, hardly uh, a success. And then they also had the plan to produce and, and, and distribute their own uh, diapers, which they also um, didn't uh, continue doing. Um, and then what is interesting there is that you say, you know, you need to bet as a company, you need to challenge yourselves, and that also shows in that, that, that silly example of the gold grazing, like really pushing your boundaries, but never bet um, uh, in a way that you bet a company. And so that's, don't bet the things that really uh, matter most, that represent what the core of your uh, service uh, is. So try to bet almost in the um, in more peripheral uh, in, in terms of your doing business. And then the last one is um, uh, this, uh, this visual represents what I would call, you know me better than I know myself. And this is an example that I want to show. When I go on Amazon, they say, isn't it time to buy these products? And then probably four out of these 10 suggestions are things that I actually ran out of or I think that I said, yeah, I should stock up on on, on some of these uh, products. Um, the thing is, Amazon has, of course, a lot of big data. They use it in a very smart way. Um, but there is also, and that I had to uh, go back to the first version of the Amazon website, back to 94, where it's not only about big data. It's also about having people uh, that, that curate, uh, people that also, uh, that are some human understanding also to uh, what the customers are and, and what you want. Uh, and I think that is also a, a, a big learning for me is is to really build on big data and, and knowing uh, uh, your uh, your client based on their behavior. But there is also that almost magic layer of uh, of how do you know a client on a on a more personal uh, level. And that brings me to the core learnings of this whole prison. And I think the first thing that I that I see as a key takeaway is that ecosystem and like that mono touch point. Uh, I think as a brand, it doesn't have a lot of potential. It's also it's all about brands. Also think Samsung and Apple and and and, and those types of brands that really build, uh, let's say, numerous uh, touch points um, and 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 products and services uh, around one uh, brand that deliver consistent um, kind of an experience but still uh, allow you to explore um, uh, different aspects of that of that brand the second one is about building anticipation not only innovation uh, don't lock yourself up in your lab and 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 make great innovations also communicate about those and create excitement um, and awareness around what you're doing and around what you're planning I think a second uh, a second learning the third um, uh, one is about the awards and, and of course not every industry has awards uh, but it's about the being recognized, it's about really going also for pride and 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 doing things within your brand and within uh, within your ecosystem that you're really proud of uh, and that you're recognized uh, for. Uh, allowing to fail, uh, something that in in current uh, business is not that easy, and it, it's really that entrepreneurship of uh, of allowing to fail that often breeds the most successful brands, although that a lot of the established brands don't allow failure because they have their quarterly results to meet and, and they have all their procedures and stage gate processes um, um, which in which you have to almost um, super validate everything that you bring into the market. Um, I believe that is very, um, also let's say, not always uh, to the best uh, for the innovation power of a, of a company. And the fifth one is uh, know me better than I know myself. Uh, use big data, use the behavioral data, but uh, also try to understand the human um, uh, behind your customer uh, to add a layer of magic to uh, to your recommendations. Um, so that's it, what I learned from my own uh, addiction. Back to Katya. 
Thank you. And I think we all learned from your addiction. And I'm hoping that Prime, uh, Prime will also come to Belgium to feed my own shopping addiction. And uh, your second point about anticipation is definitely what I think we're doing here, that we're communicating about what we're doing. And, um, and uh, it's definitely the other four are also something that we need to keep in mind and that we have also some of our own examples of, uh, um, uh, which, of course, this webinar uh, proofs. I don't know if there are any questions from our audience um, for Philip at this point. Again, if you would have any questions, if you can think of uh, something that is unclear or you might need to want, uh, learn more, uh, just reach out to Philip. I'm sure he would be happy to uh, help you out or uh, have a discussion about. Our next speaker is Nicholas and Nicholas uh, works here as a, as a senior research consultant in the tech and services team here in Belgium and he has a PhD in psychology and he will be talking about implicit innovation as he has uh, worked with implicit measures uh, back uh, when he was uh, an academic at the University of Ghent. Uh, so uh, Nicholas, uh, the floor is yours. All right, let's see whether this works. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Niklas, and uh, Katja took away almost everything I wanted to say about myself. Um, so um, before I started working here at Insights, uh, I did my PhD in experimental psychology, and there I wrote my thesis. Let's see whether you can see it. Yeah. Uh, wrote my uh, thesis and also uh, published uh, articles in high-ranking journals on the topic of implicit measures and how they can be improved to become more insightful. And uh, that is why in the next 10 minutes I want to convey to you what first implicit measures are, how they allow us to gain insights into consumer decision-making and consumer behavior. And I also want to show you the implicit propos uh, propositional task, uh, which is our newest addition in the Insights Implicit Measurement Toolbox, our internal pool of uh, implicit measures that are used at Insights Consulting. Um, but to start, um, for those who are not that familiar with the subject matter, what are implicit measures and what can they actually measure? Um, it's easiest to understand them by realizing what they are not. and. Uh, what they are not is direct or explicit measures. Let me give you an example of a typical uh, explicit measure. Um, if I ask you the question, what is your favorite ice cream flavor, you hear, or in this case, you can also read the question, you deliberately think about your answer and then you respond. Um, you give the answer to uh, uh, the answer that in your mind is best fitting after having had ample amount of time to think about it. And implicit measures, on the other hand, are measurement techniques that are designed to uh, prevent you from deliberately thinking too much about your answer before responding. Uh, they assess your automatic reactions to stimuli. And they do so by giving participants, for example, a response time window within they have to, uh, within uh, they're asked to respond. And by doing that, that is, by restricting the time people have to give their responses, implicit measures allow to tap into the participants' automatic reactions, uh, so to speak, their, their gut feelings, uh, stereotypes, biases, um, or implicit beliefs. In short, all those non-deliberate automatic thoughts that you cannot properly report when uh, being asked in a questionnaire, uh, but that still heavily impact your decisions and your behavior. Uh, and this makes these automatic reactions and implicit measures so relevant for market and marketing research because consumers are not rational decision makers. Uh, more than 95% of our daily decisions are automatic in that we act upon our gut feeling or we use heuristics or stereotypical knowledge to come to a decision. Um, to make you understand what I mean when I speak of these automatic reaction that implicit measures assess, it might be easy to show you a picture. So when you see such a picture, you experience an emotional reaction, whether it's a positive or a negative one, I don't know. But I do know that this emotional reaction occurs automatically and that you cannot prevent it from happening. 
And implicit measures are designed to capture automatic reactions to stimuli, to stimuli like uh, this cat. Uh, and then they deduce an underlying attitude or a belief that uh, impact your decision making or your behavior when you act more automatically than uh, deliberately. So uh, summarized, uh, implicit measures are measurement techniques that allow insight in person's automatic reactions. And these automatic reactions are crucial to understand as they determine the vast majority of uh, all our decisions and behavior in our daily life. Um, so now that we're a little bit more familiar with uh, uh, with what an implicit measure is and uh, what they are used for, I'm happy to present to you the newest edition of uh, the yeah, implicit measures in the Insights Implicit Toolbox, namely the implicit proposition task. Um, to yeah, to to talk a little bit more about uh, while most implicit measures work on only single words and pictures like yeah this cat. Um, one can, uh, yeah, they are, they are due to that rather unspecific. Uh, and during my PhD research, I was able to show that these automatic reactions also occur uh, with regard to more complex stimuli, namely uh, complete statements. And to demonstrate that to you, um, I'd like you to read the following statements on screen. I hope that works. All right. Uh, what happened when you read those statements was that you automatically evaluated them as being true or false for yourself. And uh, to be clear, I intentionally overshot on that last one just to show you the nuances in these automatic truth evaluations. They are not black and white. They are not yes and no, true and false, but there is a, a, they're, a, uh, they're graded. Um, in any case, this automatic truth evaluation that you hopefully experienced can also be used in implicit measures to pinpoint implicit beliefs or behavioral intentions. Um, these always occurring automatic truth evaluations are the basis of the, the task that I want to show you now. Um, and it can be used in uh, to answer various questions. To give a few, exam a few examples, um, you can test the uh, purchase intent of co uh, consumers, whether or not they would like to try out a product, or um, you can assess the promoting intentions of a brand or a product. And sticking with this last example, um, let me explain the implicit proposition task in detail. So imagine that a company wants to know how an ad for a specific product influences the promoting intentions of uh, the viewers after watching that ad, so for this ad. Um, so basically you're interested in whether or not people are likely to talk about that ad with their friends or share it with them on social media, for example. And those are all behaviors that are not planned, but rather spontaneous and thus ideal to be tested with an implicit rather than an explicit measure. Um, to test promoting intentions, we would show first the ad to participants and afterward they would complete the uh, implicit measure. And in this test, they would see statements like, um, I will talk to my friends about this ad or I will not post it on Facebook. Sorry for that. Um, let me let me see whether I can go step back. Yeah. Um, and the participants are asked to judge these statements as being true or false by pressing one of two keys on the keyboard as fast as possible. But however, there is a twist because we, uh, the participants are not asked to respond truthfully, but rather we ask them to play a role. And that's where the next slide comes into play. Um, in the first part of the task, we ask them to respond as if they are a promoter of the brand or the product. And consequently, um, they will agree with this first statement and press true, and they will disagree with the second statement and will press false. Then in the second part of the task, uh, we ask the participant to, uh, to act as if they do not want to promote the brand or the product. And consequently, they press false when they see the first statement and they press true when they see the second statement. So basically, in half of the 
in half of the test they respond in one way and in the second half of the test they respond the opposite way. Now, based on the fact that people are generally faster in responding in line with their automatically activated truth evaluations, we can use the reaction time data to deduce um, their belief, that is whether or not in this case uh, uh, would like to promote uh, a product or a brand after seeing an ad. Uh, and that, I, that, that data uh, would then allow us to determine how likely it is that a specific behavior is shown after seeing an ad. And uh, moreover, uh, this task also allows to compare the influence of different ads or different brands or different products. Mm. And as I said before, uh, promotional intention is just one example where the implicit proposition task is useful. Other examples, like I said, could be purchase intent or testing the likelihood of consumers uh, to want to try out a product. So uh, summarized, the implicit proposition task as well as the other implicit tasks that, uh, that we have here at, uh, in our Insights Implicit Toolbox always have a virtue in contexts in which you want to measure decisions and behavior that people perform automatic rather than deliberately. All right, um, that's uh, so far from me. If you're interested in the scientific literature, you can find my papers on ResearchGate. And uh, if you're interested in implicit measures in general or have any questions, uh, you see my email uh, there. Uh, I'll get back to Katja. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, very interesting, and it's definitely some food for thought on how we uh, approach uh, some of the KPIs in research. Uh, thinking about um, the famous quote that we think much less than we think we think, it's definitely something uh, worth um, further uh, exploring uh, for some of the metrics in concept testing or ID screening and so on. Uh, like Bert mentions here as well, um, I think. Uh, this is really the future uh, when it comes to uh, research. And uh, I don't know if there are any questions from the audience uh, for Nicholas or regarding implicit. So Nicholas, Neil asks, are systems sensitive enough to measure the small difference in reaction time? So yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and that is, uh, I guess, the, the the most important one when we when we try to, um, yeah, have a have a task that uh, heavily depends on the um, reaction time data, um, and we apply this online. Um, we cannot we cannot say for now because we're only in in the process of testing this task, but. Um, I'm confident that um, we, we, we will be able to uh, get the same differences in reaction time uh, because what you basically do is always compare the two blocks of trials with each other. So um, it should be, should be uh, feasible if the measurement of the reaction time on the keyboards of the participants at home is is good enough to uh, use the reaction time to analyze it at least in the, uh, the um, academic studies I did uh, with uh, stationary computers uh, there it was uh, possible but it's a it's a it's a empirical question we can only find out by by trying it out thank you Okay, and if you would have any other questions, you can always reach out to Nicholas. Uh, next up is uh, Jilke. Jilke is a customer success coach here at Insights Consulting, and she's also part, uh, part of our Insights Activation Studio team here. Uh, and she will talk about a case study we did with Silit Bang. Jilke, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Katja. Um, what happens with the insights once the research is over? For our most companies, it all ends after sharing the final results. So they uh, give a presentation to a small team or do a, a cool workshop like the ones that Thomas has showed um, to make them really aware of the needs and frictions of consumers. But afterwards, these insights are locked up in PowerPoint reports. Sometimes it happens that they involve the whole team with it by sending a newsletter and an email to the deck. But 
Mm, I'm not sure if this will really do the trick because if they open it, they see 290 slides with all kinds of research in it. That's not that engaging. So how can the insights live inside the hearts of the company? That was actually the challenge that Silid Bang was facing. Um, for those who don't know Silid Bang, it's a, an established record Bankaiser brand uh, who is offering a wide range of cleaning products. So their main focus is on power cleaners. So what was their challenge? Well, um, they uh, were looking for new and fresh insights on the cleaner category. And they wanted to let all their employees immerse in it um, to, so that they really understand the consumer's life, their habits, their rituals, their um, needs, but also the brand perception. And then they want to use that research to come up with new products and uh, marketing initiatives. So it's uh, quite ambitious, but how to get started? Well, we have set up um, a three-week CCB, a three-week consulting board uh, in France and Russia uh, to uh, create new insights. And here are a few of our key results. So the first one is that cleaning is not fun. Um, the cleaning activity itself is more like a threat, but what gives um, consumers pleasure is seeing the results afterwards and the satisfaction of having a clean room. Another uh, key result was that the bathroom is the biggest uh, frustration, the biggest um, room to clean, and also that there is a clear tension uh, when it comes to pow uh, which kind of power you need to clean the object or which room. So now they knew what the consumers wanted, but how can they share this with all the employees and let them really use it, let them really immerse it, how to activate these insights. And this was very difficult to do because the, the people who were involved in the Silid uh, Bang uh, team uh, were all coming from different countries, so they were spread across um, teams, across countries, and for many of them, it was also their second brand to work on, so it has no priority. So the issues were that there was a, a lack of time and they uh, were not able to sit around the table. So that is why we chose uh, to activate the insights online via our own insight activation studio. So the studio is an online platform uh, where we share the key insights in a visual and bite-sized way. And uh, it's, we also use our activation flow to let the employees immerse into the content. So take them on a journey um, through the insights. And how does this activation flow, this learning flow works? Well, we actually play upon the hearts, the minds, and the actions of the uh, employees. So we start with creating empathy because I've already heard it here before. Empathy is very important to understand the consumer. Um, we let them bring the research closer to home. Then we let them apply the insights to create a more consumer-centered mindset. And eventually we, ad we identify new ideas or actions to make a bigger change together. So for Silid Bang, we first started to immerse themselves um, into the um, consumer's life, and then we focus on ideation because they wanted to come up with new concepts for their brand. But before we can do that, we first needed to make the research more manageable because we had 290 slides. And for this, we needed to pick the most essential uh, insights, so the new, the surprising, or controversial insights, and then make it more bite-sized, so um, make it more manageable. And to do that, we um, focused on what are the main themes for Silid Bank to work on. And we uh, identified uh, the, the cleaning experience, so how do they clean and create spotless rooms. We also noticed that there was a big um, theme on the brand perception, and of course, how they shop for cleaning products. So we translated this into three walls, the three main teams. And for those three teams, uh, we created three quizzes um, to show them, uh, to let them experience the missing, uh, the missing dots that they had from the consumers. There were some gaps. They think they know the consumer well, but actually they don't know them that well that they, that they thought. So and the next thing that we did was to create uh, small visual um, posts called tales uh, where we involve those insights and um, not just share it but make them more engaging and for that we have our own learning formula where we start with the Sorry, I was muted. Uh, for this we started with the insights and here it was that uh, cleaning is not fun. Um, they are more um, 
it's the results that bring people joy. So that was one of the key findings from our results. Then we add an aha layer to it. So this can be an, an example that illustrates the uh, insights, for example, a consumer quote or uh, another brand example to show how they act the insight. And uh, as you could see in the video, uh, we used the case from Method, another cleaning brand, where they show them, okay, maybe cleaning is not fun, so why don't we focus on the joy of getting dirty? And they did a whole campaign around that. So with this, we show how, to, uh, how these insights can be activated and can be used in reality. And last but not least, we also add uh, a tiny task to it. So we um, use the content and we bring it closer to home. We let them recognize it. We let them understand it by adding a poll, adding a question, or even a small task to do. Uh, and here, for example, we just asked um, what they preferred more, getting dirty or cleaning. But then we have the content, uh, so content is ready, but now we of course need to involve the employees. So how do we do that? With an employee pitch. So it's a 15 minute webinar where we actually say why they don't want to miss out. So we explain the purpose for the company, but also what's in it for them. Why? What can they do with the content? What can they bring out of this by joining? And here we focus on the minimal effort, maximum result, because it's convenient. They don't need to travel. They uh, don't need to sit around the table. They can meet colleagues across the world, but from their own desk. And it's also busy business proof because it only takes them five minutes a week. Um, so it fits with their busy schedules. And also very important, it's fun. Because Mary Poppins was right. In every job that must be done, there should be an element of fun. This is also very important. So how uh, now they are ready um, to be immersed into the content. They know why, they know what they can bring out of it, but how do we immerse them? Well, we focus on the recognition and understanding of the insights. So to um, bring them inside our journey, we focus on only one team at a time, only one wall at a time, and we uh, keep that focus for two weeks. And in those two weeks, we ask them to complete three simple tasks um, so this will take them only the five minutes a week. So, for example, we started for Silibang with a small quiz to show the gaps and see how much they still remember from the insights. Then we asked them to complete one tell, to give the, their comments to one tell. For example, which object requires the most cleaning power? And here, the, these questions are more to um, get that reaction, that recognition from um, the employees that their consumer is not just an abstract person out there, but it's, that it could be that it could be them, that it could be their mom. That they say, "Hey, uh, it's it's not that far away. It's actually someone from my environment." And the last task that we asked, uh, that we asked them was um, to add their own inspiration. So what inspires them in the world of cleaning? And this was a warming up for the ideation phase um, because their uh, ultimate goal, of course, is to have new concepts, new ideas uh, for the Silid Bank brands. So with this research, we, uh, we will identify the key frictions for the consumers um, and how we can solve that. And we start with a first harvesting round where, they, where people who have an ID can add their IDs. But we also have an innovation month where we um, use different kind of ideation techniques to push um, them to out of their comfort zone and find some outside the box ideas. For example, we have the ideation technique of brand alphabets. Uh, we also use thinking hats or brainwalking. So there are a lot of different techniques that we can use for this. So what is the impact? Uh, the stu their studio has uh, only recently been launched, so I can share you the results after one week, but I can tell you they are amazing because we started only with one wall, one quiz and six inside tiles. So that's not that much, but in one week we already had 47 users registered and 21 quizzes completed. Uh, fun facts. Um, the main score of the quiz is three and a half on five, so they don't know the um, their consumer as well as they thought. And uh, we also saw that a lot of uh, people uh, redid the quiz uh, just to get that five on five. Another important thing that we saw was that uh, every inside tell uh, was watched 50 times. Uh, so this means that almost every user has seen every inside tell on average. And all, of course, there were also a lot of discussions and added tells. But we also saw some uh, starting habits because 
people uh, went to the studio multiple times a week and they spent about uh, they saw about six pages per visit and this uh, in general this led them to more than 30 minutes in the first week that they spent on the platform and we only asked for five minutes so i think these are very great results um, what can uh, uh, what are the takeaways what are my, uh, our main learnings for engaging employees well, the first thing is ask only one thing at a time because there are a lot of things fighting for their attention. So don't ask too much. Keep it simple. Um, keep it tiny. That's my second point. Um, because if it's too difficult, um, they will postpone it and it won't happen. And the third thing, make it fun. Uh, that's also very important. So Katja, um, back to you. Yes, thank you, Yilke. I think it's definitely a great example of how to get away from the clutter of, uh, of, of slides in those crowded PowerPoint uh, reports and let insights come to life within an organization. Um, uh, looking at the chat box, are there any questions for Yilke uh, on the case or on the, regarding the Insight Activation Studio? Um, here is uh, Yilke's email. So. If you would have any questions, just reach out to her. Next up is Steven. Uh, Steve uh, is a data scientist and uh, works together with Insights Consulting as he's finishing his PhD in markets analysis. And uh, he has worked on how to predict consumer engagement in online uh, conversations in consumer consulting boards. So a bit of artificial intelligence here. Um, uh, Steven, the floor is uh, yours. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining this presentation. Uh, as Scotia just explained before, I am playing here a dual role here. So maybe it's better before I start with the content of the presentation to contextualize everything with a quick quant intro about uh, the research uh, I have been doing. So uh, my name is uh, Steven, I'm 26 years old and I just entered the last year of, of a, a three-year collaboration between ESX School of Management and Insights Consulting in function of a PhD project. My research centers around one topic and that's uh, proactive community management. Uh, for this research, we have been looking at three years of data from 10 ongoing CCBs and we considered more than 150,000 uh, posts for this. I'm having a problem here, so it's working. So uh, we, and we considered more than 150,000 posts for this. We looked at the activity and sentiment of all the members and moderators in those communities, and we analyzed about uh, 7 million data points for this. As far through this collaboration, together with Insights Consulting, we have written two managerial papers about it, presented the research at uh, four conferences, and we even got awarded uh, through the Future Talent Meets the Industry Initiative from ASMR, won a $2,000 prize, and awards from the Marketing Science Institute for promising research on hot topics. But that's enough uh, for the introduction. Let us start with the content of the presentation. Normally, I would ask this question by saying to raise your hands if you do so, but as uh, seeing the result may be difficult because of this webinar, uh, you may respond in whatever manner that you want. So therefore, uh, for all of you who can call himself or herself a market research analyst, well, you all will be fired 20 years from now on. You may think this is very bold or very rude statement coming from somebody who is a freshman here within the market research industry, but this is not my opinion. This is based on research from the Oxford University. You all will be placed by robots. By knowing about the fact that robots are coming and uh, they looked at all types of jobs, that's what everybody actually does, and uh, which parts due to new emerging technologies could be replaced by robots. They even have an online tool for it that allows you to calculate the percent your job is at risk at 20 years from now on. Like we see here, bookkeepers have a pretty high risk level. The main idea is that if your job requires more creativity, negotiation, helping others and doing niche things, that you're more safe to still have your job in the future. Well, for all you market research analysts out there, I did the exercise for you. It points out that you have a 61% chance at risk of having your job in the future. 
So it's kind of a medium le risk level, so you don't have to be that afraid. But what can we do about it? Because this is just what, about research. Uh, this is just what the research say, uh, says. We can turn this actually into an advantage. So how can we anticipate on this number to make sure that we're more safe of our, of our jobs? Well, it's to embrace the new up upcoming technologies, reshift your focus to high value human exclusive tasks, and letting the other parts of the job to be done by computers. And the research that we have been doing is a perfect application for this. So that's what I'm going to present here. And I'm very lucky because I explain it very easily through the Movie Minority Report. So the Movie Minority Report, to refresh your minds, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a movie that describes the world in which murder is predicted by oracles and therefore can be stopped. It stars Colin Farrell and Tom Cruise, who is part of a police unit that arrests those murders before it's actually going to take place. Well, to make the link with communities, let me make a very cheesy analogy. Where murder is a threat for the world Tom Cruise lives in, member disengagement is the same for moderators and structural ongoing CCBs. We identify two types of member disengagement, low quantity and low quality. Low quantity, if the member does not participate enough in the topics that are being organized in a community, and low quality, if what the member says, uh, says doesn't say anything at all. So as a result, if those, ty those types of behavior occur very frequently, the community may not be able to deliver the useful insights anymore. So therefore, as we want to sustain ongoing CCBs on the long term, it's crucial to better member disengagement. And all the moderators can do a very uh, good job to better member disengagement, but it can require a lot of energy. So therefore, let me present to you an approach that can help uh, community management uh, to do it more cost efficiently. It's proactive community management. Proactive community management is a moderation practice that allows the community moderators to work proactively, objectively, and time cost, cost efficiently. It consists of four principles, prediction, detection, precision, and prevention. And I can explain it to you through the movie minority report. Well, in the movie, a main idea is that the future can be seen. Well, in real life, you can also look at the future this may maybe not a very wise decision to rely on oracles or other frauds. There's still something else, and it's called predictive analytics. Predictive analytics is a technique that predicts future events by constructing models uh, on historical data through machine learning techniques. And that's what you're going to do in the community context by introducing predictive analytics to identify member disengagement proactively. Our studies show that it's possible and very effective to predict member activity in the future. This means that we can predict for each member what their future performance will be in the future. Now, how can we ma make this uh, very practical in a community context and for uh, the moderator? Well, it's to combine the two dimensions, quantity and quality, with the respective activation levels, high and low, to go up to a four quadrant framework that allows you to identify easily the future performance of each member. So therefore, we can classify each member into one of the quadrants uh, to see what their future behavior will be like. So we can identify those members with low quantity behavior. We can identify those members with low quality behavior. And therefore, we can identify uh, four profiles of the future participant. Now, for all the moderators out there, do you know the community stars, the high potentials, the honors, and the pacifists in your community? Well, through predictive analytics, through this framework, you can identify those profiles proactively, objective, objectively, and automatically. So we can actually see the future of the community participant. So that's what the predict prediction principle is about. Second, in the movie, they look into the future by using oracles. The oracle tells what will happen in the future. There's a quote that says, we see what they see. But maybe more importantly, the question here is, how do they see it? How do they see what they see? Well, for predictive analytics, this works by identifying those patterns in historical data that explain future events. The more intuitive explanation is, is that it tries to find habits. Human behavior can be actually quite predictable. This is the same for the community context and community members. 
one of the interesting patterns that we found is that a moderator is not use a narcissistic writing style. If a moderator in a community talks too much about himself or herself and not about the members, members will be more likely to engage in disengagement behavior. So therefore, we must avoid a narcissistic moderator writing style. So we can see in the future by identifying historical patterns that explain future behavior. So that's what the detection principle is about. Third, in the movie, there's an important discussion between Tom Cruise and Colin Farrell about the credibility of the system. Tom Cruise says that the system is perfect, while Colin Farrell doubts those statements. In predictive analytics, there are two important things to say about this. First, perfect prediction is not possible. No one can perfectly say what is going to happen in the future. So 100 predictive accuracy is also not reliable for prediction models. Now, how can we identify good models? Well, a rule of thumb is that it must perform better than random choice, which in our case is 50%. If you would decide to randomly between low or high quantity, you have a 50% chance of being right. So therefore, a prediction model must perform better than that. So in our study, we saw that our prediction models have a pretty good performance. We are able to correctly predict low quality behavior in seven out of the 10 cases while making correct predictions for lo low quantity in almost eight out of 10 cases. So this proves that our models are trustworthy. Another important aspect to mention for predictive analytics and these types of applications is uh, the adoption. Sometimes you will give up accuracy, predictive accuracy to make the model more comprehensible and justifiable for the business user here, the moderator. So su successful adoption will require a trade-off decision and not only aiming for high accuracy. So that's what the precision principle is about. So last, in the movie you see that murder is stopped and prevented before it, it's actually going to take place. That's now also an important implication with predictive analytics. Because we can predict, we can anticipate on it and prevent it from happening. Because we can identify member disengagement proactively at the member level, we can adapt the prevention campaign and go for personalization. Now, how does it work practically in a community context? Well, here we'll combine the strengths of the machine and the human to go for a two-stage approach. So the machine can identify future behavior by using the prediction models. It can contextualize it by giving the background, community information, and suggestions for prevention. And then the moderator can focus on the high value task and finalize by executing or approving the decision for the prevention action. So we can prevent member disengagement from impacting the community. So that's what the pre prevention principle is about. So this is proactive community management. Proactive community management consists of four principles, prediction, detection, precision, and prevention. Proactive community management allows the moderator to manage a community and enable, enables the moderator to go onto a new level of augmented intelligence so they can focus on what really matters. So don't be the machine. Adopt and embrace the new technologies to be the Tom Cruise in your community. So you can actually be more safe of, the, of our jobs and be, pre be prepared for what's coming. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Definitely a bit scary to think that we will all uh, be replaced by robots, but like you demonstrated, this uh, brings uh, some opportunities for us in research. I don't know if there are any questions from our audience uh, for Stephen. Again, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to him. Um, also at the Insights Conference, two of our newest innovations were launched while well, we all got a sneak peek of them uh, there. They were presented by the different teams working on these innovations. And um, here in the webinar, you will get a sneak peek of one of them presented by uh, Tom de Rijk. Tom de Rijk is one of our managing partners uh, at Insights Consulting, and um, our, he will introduce Galvin. Um, I'm not going to say anything about it. I will uh, give the floor to Tom, who is now in Munich. So we will virtually meet you move to Munich uh, right now. Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katja. 
Indeed, it's time to introduce Galvin to you. And it's also time to talk a little bit more even about automation, artificial intelligence, and virtual reality. If you look at market research and market research conferences today, I think we can definitely say that automation and artificial intelligence are two of the buzzwords that you hear a lot at those conferences. And I think it, there is a very good reason for that. Because if you look at the recent history of market research, let's say at the last 20 years, we can see uh, various waves of innovation. Um, we have the digital or the online wave. We have the wave where social uh, media and social technology changed the way we do qualitative research. And recently we also saw, of course, uh, the mobile revolution. I think that this next wave, this wave of automation and AI in market research will have a bigger impact than the three I just mentioned have ever had altogether. So there will be a big impact of automation and artificial intelligence on what we do as market researchers, as agencies and as client-side researchers. Just quoting Ray Pointer from UMR here, 75% of what we today know as market research and what we do in market research will in the next couple of years be replaced by automation and artificial intelligence. This is pretty scary. I think it's pretty scary and we are scared. It's logic that we are scared. Humans are always a little bit scared of something that is new. Uh, we were afraid of the steam engine, we were afraid of electricity. In market research, we were afraid of online research. So it's almost logic that we are afraid of the wave of information and AI coming to us as well. But I think that it's indeed like Stephen just said uh, in his speech, we don't need to be afraid. It's not that we are going to lose our jobs. On the contrary, I think this is a big opportunity to outsource repetitive tasks, to outsource that tasks that don't add value to machines, to automated processes, and to artificial intelligent computers. I think that's the opportunity that we all going to do added value tasks, that we have more time to spend on the things that really matter, to engage with customers, to engage with consumers, and to turn insights into impact. Moreover, it's even the case, I think, that computers are going to help us to do things we were just not possible to do before. They will augment our intelligence as well. So don't think of automation and artificial intelligence in market research as a threat. See it as an opportunity to stop doing the things that are repetitive, that are not fun to do, that don't add value, and to start doing more of the added value tasks to really make our jobs fun and to make them high impact jobs, to turn literally beautiful insights into beautiful impact on a company level. At Insights Consulting, we have always been busy uh, with uh, innovative techniques and innovative approaches. And this time, with exponential technologies like uh, virtual reality and artificial intelligence coming, it's not different. We are already experimenting um, with these type of technologies for a couple of months now. And you can think, well, is that really what you guys at Insights Consulting should be busy with? Because for now, we all know those things more like from uh, science fiction movies and from the technology blocks that are usually years ahead. And yes, it's true that maybe to some extent those technologies are not yet doing what they should do. Maybe if you use them, you're a little bit disappointed. But I think it's the moment, the moment is now to start to explain it. Because we know that those technologies will grow exponentially. They almost become better by the day. They almost become cheaper to use by the day. So in no time, you will see that those technologies will lead to amazement and to true business growth. And that's why at Insights Consulting, in our fuzzy front end, we are already experimenting with it. We are building prototypes, and we want to show you what the future might look like.
So we are applying artificial intelligence and all those other uh, pieces of, of exponential technology to our different kind of solutions. We are automating our different kind of solutions so that the people at Insights can really focus on added value tasks. So we did that also with our Insight Activation Studio. And in one of the previous presentations, Ilka already very nicely demonstrated in the Solid Bank case what an Insight Activation Studio is and what an Insight Activation Studio can do in terms of turning insights into impact. Actually, in one sense, an activation studio is an online, social, and collaborative place where people from one company come together to be confronted with consumer insights and turn those consumer insights into real business actions and real business impact. So we applied the two main concepts of uh, today's presentation, of this presentation, to our activation studio. First, automation, and secondly, artificial intelligence. Automation. What do we do? Well, all the tasks that normally should be done by humans in terms of sending out newsletters, doing some basic moderation of the platform, is outsourced to a smart machine. The smart machine is, by, so, is, is in that way taking over the repetitive tasks of a human coach, customer success coach um, like Ilke. Moreover, uh, the tool also allows us to do things that were just not possible before. The tool can really push somebody from his first visit onto the studio towards being a great contributor. We have defined certain steps and when people reach those steps, the computer will probe them and will trigger them to move on to the next step. And that in different messages through di and through different formats. Like what you see on the screen is like a pop-up with a chat message coming from Yilke, or it seems like it's coming from Yilke, probing that person to move on towards the next stage of being an active contributor on this Inside Activation Studio. So Yilke is not there all the time, but it seems like she's there moderating 100 people at the same time, giving them a very personalized kind of experience. So you see that on the one hand, automation here makes that Yilke now has more time to spend with our clients. Yilke has more time to think about how to turn the insights into action and how to make the Insight Activation Studio a really vibrant place, a really a, really a place where things happen, rather than that she needs to be busy with repetitive tasks. And moreover, she's there all the time. Something I think that was just not possible before. Then artificial intelligence. We also brought that concept into our activation studio. I think the real magic with artificial intelligence happens when you combine it with the future of computer interfaces, chatbots. So when you create a artificially intelligent chatbot. And that's what we created. And that's Galvin. Galvin is actually a chatbot that through AI software and um, language processing software is able to have a real conversation with you. And you ask questions about the consumer world and Galvin will look into the activation studio, into all the insights and all the data that is there, how he can give you a very unique and personalized answer. So it's almost like talking to a human. I think it's even better than talking to a human because in just a matter of seconds, Galvin will give you that insight that normally a human should, um, should, should take hours for going through different PowerPoint reports and being lucky to find that one insight that you are looking for. To make it a little bit more concrete and illustrative, I have three cases uh, for ways in which we use uh, the prototype of Galvin and in which probably you can use Galvin uh, in the future. Case number one is that we can impersonate a consumer segment or personas. The example that you see on the screen is from MasterCard. For that company, we uh, brought on our Inside Activation Studio their segmentation to life and triggered people to turn the knowledge that they have about the different segments into real and concrete action.
So what happens here? Well, you start a conversation with the persona for one segment, in this case, Anna. And Galvin will impersonate Anna. Galvin will use all the insights and data that he, he or she or it has about that particular segment into that one persona and give answers to you like he or she it is that person. So it's talking to, let's say, an aggregated version of the consumers that are being part of that particular segment. Second use case is that Galvin becomes your coach. So Galvin will in the morning tell you what kind of new and relevant insights there are for you given the job that you're doing. Um, and Galvin will also coach you in the sense that in the future, Galvin will look into your calendar, your Outlook calendar, and tell you in the morning, maybe these two insights are relevant given the meetings that you have today. Thirdly, Galvin becomes your assistant. If you're in a meeting, you probably already uh, had that uh, similar feeling. You, you want to know, is there an insight around this? What would a consumer think about this? Well, from now on, you just turn to your mobile phone. You go into your favorite um, chat application, WhatsApp, Messenger, whatever. You connect to Galvin and you ask Galvin, Galvin, do you have particular kind of information for me, insights for me around how consumers look at packaging uh, of our product? Galvin will go into the data and in a matter of seconds will tell you what insights that are available. He will ask you a couple of follow-up questions to really get to that one insight you need at that particular moment during that meeting. So Galvin today can already chat with you, understand your questions and give answers. Galvin can proactively to some extent provide you with inspiration and Galvin can also give you the updates you need when you need them. In the future, we are working further on improving Galvin and its capabilities. We um, are working very hard on answering more complex questions immediately without the need for Galvin to probe. We are working on productive suggestions, looking into your calendar, seeing what meetings you have, and tell you what you need. And while you don't know, you will need it. We also put memory into Galvin so that next time you come back, Galvin knows what you have asked last time and will ask you how that went if you need more information on that so Galvin will become really smart as smart as a human being and we are also working on giving uh, the tool the the product more um, personality and adding instead of just typing also voice control so for those who have seen the movie her um, maybe we will get into a situation where you will fall in love with Galvin like uh, the main character is falling in love uh, with Samantha, his artificial intelligence assistant and operating system. So in the future, Galvin will become that kind of assistant, that kind of coach, that kind of consumer, and always be your fingertips. And he, she, it becomes future best friend comes to doing your day-to-day -day job and working with customer insights. But I also promised you next to automation, some artificial intelligence, I promised you also virtually. Because yes, it's important that we think about how we can create an inside activation studio that is fully automated so that we can really focus together with you on turning insights into action and also doing offline workshops that we really or added value into that space. Yes, it's important that we have something like Galvin that brings really insights to your fingertips and that um, frees all those insights from all those PowerPoint reports in which they are caged. Important that we really can bring those insights to life, like we saw in Thomas's presentation, that we can not only use pictures and movies and text, but also that we can create immersive experiences. And what you see here is a prototype of the VR version of our Inside Activation Studio, where really we can dive into a tile and we can bring that kind of experience to life. 
just like you could step into Thomas's bat bathroom. Um, in in this example, you could step into a store and see a shelf and as a marketeer experience how it is for a consumer to be confronted with uh, an overload of options and uh, really have the stress um, to make a decision. So I think that the end of uh, reports is near. We have never liked them, let's be honest, but I think in the future when we have social collaborative places to work around and with insights like the Inside Activation Studio, when we have Galvin on top of that, that can bring you insights when you need them, even when you don't know you need them, and when we have immersive experiences to bring those insights to life like VR applications, I don't think we need PowerPoint anymore. So let's all work together to buy 2020 just a couple of years from now, have PowerPoint literally banned out of the market research. I hope that you accept my challenge and looking forward to questions here or on social media. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Tom. I'm sure we will hear much more about Galvin soon. Uh, are there any questions for Tom or maybe for Galvin? I think we can also ask him, right? Or it. Any questions? Again, reach out to Tom if you would uh, have some uh, questions about Galvin, artificial intelligence, the future of research. Uh, I'm sure he will uh, uh, be happy to help you out. This is uh, the end of our webinar uh, where we had uh, six different uh, presentations uh, from our 78 people that were on stage um, uh, during our own very own insights conference I hope you enjoyed it um, if there are any questions uh, you can still use the chat uh, box and uh, we will happy to answer them um, the deck will be uh, sent to you uh, as well as the recording so uh, you can always reach out to the speakers and if you're interested in what we're doing and so on uh, on our blog we also have some blog posts on uh, some of the other presentations some of the other insights and learning from our conference so uh, uh, definitely log on to our website if you're curious for more. Um, if there are no questions, I wish you a very uh, nice evening, afternoon, uh, wherever you're listening. Thank you for joining.